What's up, y'all? It's your girl, Toyzilla. Welcome to another episode of Toyzilla Streams Book Club. Yes! Did y'all come to read? I know you didn't. That's why I'm doing it. You're welcome. <laughs> so if you haven't caught up, we are reading The Looking Glass Wars Book 2, Seeing Red. You can find all of the previous chapters and the first book, The Looking Glass Wars, on our YouTube channel. So I hope y'all checked it out. Like and subscribe. Let me know what y'all think inside of the comment section. I would really appreciate that. Now today we'll be reading chapters 12, 13, and 14 in the series. Now, if all you read, y'all feel like y'all want to go ahead and draw some artwork, you know, because, you know, my voice and the words on the page just take you away, feel free to send it into our Discord. If you're watching this live on Twitch, that's right below the video. There's a link to the channel. Remember, if you like what you see, you turned on your PC and viewed it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get, get started with tonight's chapter, shall we? I feel like y'all are going to like these. Ooh. Well, let's sit my bookmark down, y'all. Okay. Okay, here we go. Chapter 12. Mm. The fire crystals in the shallow pit cast a modest heat as Hatter sat staring at Weaver's stilled image. He had paused the diary, wondering if something were wrong with its inner workings because his beloved appeared blurry as if seen through a veil of water. But then he felt the wet on his cheeks. It wasn't a diary. He was crying. She was dressed in the Allison uniform, rough fibered and nondescript except for the emblem of a white heart on the cuff of the right shirt sleeve. His hand twitched. The diary began to play. If you're viewing this, Weaver said, then you have proved wrong all those who currently believe you and the princess are dead. Although it also means that I'm most likely dead. She smiled sadly at the space between them. Hatter nearly slammed the diary shut. He'd been wrong. He wasn't ready for this. But to relegate Weaver's image back inside the book? No. He couldn't do that either. It would be too much like shutting her away in a tomb. And so he sat there, watching her recorded image, listening to her every word. This diary is for me as much as it is for you, Hatter. I hope I'll be able to tell you what I have to say. <clears throat> Let me just start that over. I got a little tongue twisted. This diary is for me as much as it is you, Hatter. I hope I'll be able to tell you what I have to say in person. But circumstances here are dangerous. Just because I'm alive today is no guarantee that I'll be so tomorrow. You probably already know that Red has destroyed the millinery. Her goal is genocide, to wipe the milliner breed from existence. It's believed that she salvaged the ID tracking system from the millinery and is using it for this purpose, after which she'll destroy it. You often told me that one born a milliner still needs the proper, the proper training to make the most of his or her natural gifts, but Red puts more credence in the birth than in the training. As soon as the first milliner was ambushed by Red, I hid out here, not sure if I'd be targeted too. There are rumors that a few milliners have so far managed to escape their assassins and are hiding undercover somewhere. If the rumors are true, I hope they will continue to evade their would-be murderers so that once the rebellion succeeds, and I believe it must, they will come out of hiding and you can lead them in a new millinery. Hatter felt a twinge. Reestablishing the millinery was the last thing he felt like doing. I understand that our relationship was difficult for you, Hatter. Weaver went on. 
I know that despite how thoughtful and loving you always were to me, a part of you was angry with yourself for succumbing to your feelings for anyone, let alone a civilian. A master of self-control as all of Wonderland believes you to be, you shouldn't have been consorting with me. You thought your feelings a mark against you, an indication of weakness. I no longer think so, he said aloud. I always knew your duties could call you away, Weaver continued. It was wrong of me not to tell you when I first found out, but Hatter, my love, I'm sorry. She wiped her eyes. I should have told you before you left. I was pregnant. Had to remain perfectly still. Pregnant? With his child? So long did he remain unmoving that, when he again began conscious, became conscious of his surroundings, he thought he had paused the diary. But then he saw Weaver's chest rise and fall, rise and fall. She was breathing, struggling with her own emotions. I know how you feel about Happers, she said at last. And I was never sure how you'd react to hearing that you had fathered one. Every time I thought to tell you of my joy, of our joy, I found an excuse not to. I did plan to tell you the next time we'd be on Talon's Point together. But as you know, there was no next time. Too preoccupied with the vision before him, Hatter didn't hear the pop that sounded either the bursting of an air bubble in one of the fire crystals or an explosion from outside the cave. I couldn't give birth alone, so I risked an overland journey to the Allison camp in the everlasting forest. Doctors there delivered me a beautiful baby girl with the saddest smile Hatter had ever seen, the smile of one who had long ago resigned herself to a life incomplete and unsatisfactory, Weaver said. It's time you knew your daughter's name, Hatter. But just then, as if surprised by an intruder, she looked off at someone or something not recorded by the diary. And the pop that Hatter had failed to hear a moment before proved to be the opening salvo in a battle raging on the nearby mountain, which Hatter now heard without hearing. This whole being fixed on Weaver's image, already fizzling to nothing as she whispered, Molly. Ooh. So y'all mean to tell me that Molly Humberg is the head of Sada? Ooh wee. Okay. Okay. Chapter 13. <laughs> what do you mean you can't locate an enemy to fight? The general cried, indicating the havoc surrounding them in Genevieve Square, then splitting into the two figures of Doppel and Ganger so as to worry twice as much, both of the generals pacing and rubbing their brows. The white knight and rook exchanged an uneasy glance. My chessmen have canvassed the vicinity and found no one, explained the knight. We have a great many injured among the civilian population, but no casualties as of yet. Let's keep it that way, said Doppel. Yes, let's, said Ganger. But someone caused this. Or something, offered the Rook. Whoever or whatever it was, it's made the continuum impenetrable. As if to prove the point, a panicked Wonderlander with blood matted hair sprinted past. Must get home to my family, he was saying. Must make sure they're safe. The chessmen and generals watched as the traumatized fellow ran straight for the nearest looking glass portal and was knocked back, repelled, when he tried to enter it. The journals called for a nurse who led the victim off to a triage center located in a tailor's shop. To a triage center located in a tailor's shop on the corner. That's what happens whenever anyone tries to enter the continuum from any portal whatsoever, the rook said. It's impossible to gain access, and we've no idea if the condition is temporary or permanent. Not good, fretted Doppel. Not good at all, agreed Ganger. Sir, a young pawn approached, accompanied by a pair of Wonderlanders. These men were in the continuum when that, uh, thing happened. I thought their experiences might be able to give us some insight into what we're dealing with. Let's hope so said the knight. 
At a nod from the pond, one of the men offered what he could. I don't know exactly how to describe it, really. It was like a feeling like I was a piece of junk being carried along on a tidal wave or... Not for me, it wasn't, said the other. I'm not sure if this will make any sense, but a bright nothingness came up and knocked the breath out of me. I don't remember anything after that, except that once I could see and breathe again, I wasn't in the continuum. I was stranded high in the branches of an unappreciative tree, and my wife, we'd been returning home from a barbecue at her cousin Laura's. She makes the best barbecued dorm mouse you'll ever taste in your lives. So tender that the meat slips off the bone. And she seasons it with scrumptious glaze. Just the right amount of sweet and tart and spicy. Oh, and her corn relish. The night cleared his throat. Mm -mm, right. So anyway, I landed in a tree and my wife was half a block away. Sprawled on top of a citizen who, the nerve of him, complained that she'd landed on him purposefully. The pawn waited, eager to learn how helpful his civilians had been. The generals resumed their pacing, and the rook blinked at the men with something like disbelief. Only the knight remembered himself. You've done the queen a great service, providing such a sport of helpful information, he said. And to the pawn, see... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and to the pawn, see that these gentlemen are examined by a physician before you release them. Yes, sir. The pawn saluted and led the Wonderlanders off. We'll have to station guards at all the portals, said Doppel, and see if we can't analyze whatever is contaminated to continuum, said Ganger. What is that bleeping? It was coming from the rook's ammo belt, which looped over his battlements and crossed in an X on his chest. It's the latest model crystal communicator, generals, he said. I press this button here. The chessman pressed a button on the miniature keypad strapped to his forearm. The incoming message alert stopped sounding, and then this little hole here, he pointed to a nozzle-like opening on his ammo belt, shoots out a visual of the transmission that all of us can view equally well. A screen formed in the air before him, on which appeared a frantic pond patrolling one metropolis of Sidian Park neighborhood. Glass eyes are in the city, the pond shouted. Repeat, glass eyes have infiltrated one metropolis. A lot of them. Behind the pond, fleet-footed glass eyes could be seen rampaging through the streets, overpowering one chessman and card soldier after another. Unable to locate their point of entry, the pawn shouted. They seem to be coming from everywhere. A glass eye was rocketing up fast behind him, getting closer and closer. Look out, the rook cried. The transmission went dead. The generals were already barking commands into their flip screen, older model crystal communicators. All available decks deployed to Obsidi Obsidian Park. For white imagination's sake, get civilians off the streets. But neither the generals nor the chessmen voiced what all knew to be true. They were not equipped to counter a major attack on the capital city, not with the continuum rendered useless and the numerous decks that had been dispatched to military outposts stranded along the edges of the queendom. The queen must be informed, the knight said. There's no need. They all turned to see Alice Hart, gifted with the most powerful imagination ever to legally occupy Wonderland Stone, walking toward the middle of the square with scepter in hand. The sight of her, so matter-of-factly confident, might have been enough to give even the walrus butler courage, but the chessmen and generals weren't the walrus butler. Their courage didn't need bolstering. They would not whine about the glass-eyed superior numbers. They would not disappoint their queen. The rook unholstered his 8052, checked the supply of projectile decks in his animal belt. The knight unsheathed his sword and stood at the ready. Generals Dauber and Ganger each split in two, and the four generals each divided again, forming eight generals in all, four doppels, and four gangers. The more bodies to aid in Wonderland's defense, the better. There, the knight said. Alice had already seen them, a contingent of glass eyes bearing down from Slithy Avenue. 
keeping close to the buildings, darting from vegetable to vegetable. The rook started forward, not want to wait for trouble if he could help it. No, Alice said. Let them come. It'll be the last thing they ever do. Alice spun to her left and there stood Dodge, sword in one hand, crystal shooting in the other. They held each other's gaze. What's he doing here? I told Bibwit. Shouldn't you be guarding the palace? The rook asked with a knowing smirk. Dodge shrugged. Didn't take his eyes off Alice. First they're in one metropolis. Next thing you know, they're marching to the palace halls. He looked at the rook and winked. Besides, I have to make sure you do the job right, don't I? The glass eyes were letting civilians climb out of ground floor windows. The glass eyes were letting civilians climb out of ground floor windows, burst from doorways, and escape into the distance. Unconcerned with ordinary Wonderlanders, now that they'd located the Queen, they'd hold up in the suddenly abandoned shops and office towers to game with their 8052s, crystal shooters, spike jack tumblers, and orb cannons. They strafed the square, orb generators burning a path through the air toward Wonderland's Queen. Even before Dodge, the Knight, the Rook, and eight generals could die for cover, Alice used the power of her imagination to hurl the missiles back upon the enemy. At the slightest dip of her scepters, the, jo the orb generators reversed directions and broke into smaller orbs, each of them homing in on a glass eye. Bloosh, kabloosh, blah, 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 blah. A rapid series of blasts as glass... Uh, a rapid series of blasts as glass eyes exploded into millions of glass eye bits. Not one of the enemy was left functioning alive. A second wave, Alice breathed, because more glass eyes were streaking in from Slithy Avenue's horizon. They're on Whiffling Heights, called the book. And Gimble Lane, said Dodge. And Berlig, said the Knight and Generals. Not the most life-affirming news. Glass eyes storming Genevieve Square from every available street. Alice and Dodge, the chessmen and generals, they were surrounded. <sighs> Chapter 14 If the ever-wise Bibwit Hart had been with Hatter on Talon's Point, he would have bent his ears in sympathy, sensitive to the news divulged by Weaver's image. The diary has left you with more questions than it has answered, Hida. He might have said, but you shouldn't be surprised. The most important questions are always answered with yet more questions. Which wisdom would have com comforted the milliner? Which wisdom would have comforted the milliner? Not at all. If Weaver had given birth at the Allison camp within the everlasting forest, why had she left the safety of the camp? Why had she abandoned her daughter, merely to place a diary at Talon's Point in case he returned? It hardly seemed worth it. There must have been another reason. But here, Hatter was overcome with a peculiar feeling. He'd been having peculiar feelings for a while now, but this one was really peculiar. He was feeling paternia, paternal. How old had Molly been when Weaver left? What did she remember of her mother? Had she been told anything of him? Had he thought back to the time he had spent with the girl, the battles they had fought against Red and her forces? He'd been impressed with her fidelity to Alice, her courage and fortitude to helping the princess recover Wonderland's thumb, and he hoped he had said as much when he recommended her to be Alice's bodyguard. But he could recall nothing that definitively told him she knew who he was. Her sass and occasional disregard for his opinions could have been either the lashing out of a bitter daughter or the antagonism of a teen determined to elbow a space for herself in the adult world. He repeated the fact to convince himself of its reality. Humberg Molly is my daughter. Humberg Molly is my daughter. How could he act the recluse, pining away on a mo mountaintop for a woman who would never return while her daughter, their daughter, lived? Because it's in Molly that Weaver most lives. Yes, and for Weaver's sake, for his and Molly's sake, he had to return to Wondertropolis. He got to his feet, would prepare immediately, 
Blush! He'd been hearing explosions outside the camp for some time, he realized. He stepped out onto the ridge and saw on the nearby mountain below the comet shrinks of orb generators, the fiery blossoms of exploded barracks and munitions catches. A Wonderland military post was under attack. In an instant, he returned to the depths of the cave from the dust-covered pile of millinery gear and with the skill of a footballer chipping the ball into the goal, he kicked up his top hat, sent it flying onto his head. Shoulder to shoulder and ankle to ankle, the college soldiers locked themselves together to form a shield around the communications bunker. How many of their deck were still alive, they had no way of knowing. Perhaps only the pair of the tin cards inside the bunker and themselves. It had been a, it had been a while since they had sighted anyone else, yet they would defend the bunker so long as they had breath left in them. Not a single soldier harbored any illusions. The attack had caught the base unprepared. They were outnumbered. They would not survive. Too much smoke in the air to see the enemy, but suddenly, a series of wishing sounds, like something repeatedly cutting the air, then a lull, then the quiet that inevitably precedes the wind shriek of an incoming orb generator. The card soldiers braced themselves for impact, but instead of the expected explosion, thump, 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 thump. what the? One of the soldiers said. The limbs of the glass eyes clumped down around them. Arms chopped off at the shoulder joint. Legs ending at the top of the thigh. Hands and feet and torsos. All with the spaghetti of wires and lab grown veins spilling from holes where no holes should have been. From the direction the guard soldiers had expected their death to come, the silhouette of a wonderlander appeared out of the smoke. A Wonderlander they would have recognized anywhere. The hat. The dramatic swing of the coat. The spinning blades on his wrist. Hatter. Madigan. <laughs> oh, man. And that is the end of chapter 14. I tell you what, y'all. This is getting real interesting. To find out that Hatter has a daughter... And to think he was so rude when they first met. And now they're such good friends. Does she know? I need to know. Hopefully we find out next time. So once again, this is your girl Toyzilla. If you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. And follow on Twitch. And I'll see you guys next time. If you have any artwork that you'd like to submit, please do so on the Discord channel. Alright y'all. If you like what you see, you turned on your PC and viewed it. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Tazilla is out. Peace.